Uh, what do I think about when I hike alone? Usually while on the way up in the, the steep spots or even just going up like a simple fire tower road, I usually think, why the fuck am I doing this? Most of the time, that's why what I'm thinking. Why the hell am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through this crap? And usually it's because of the beautiful stunning view at the top or when I get to the the balsam smell towards the top or just listening to the sound of uh, some of the birds like the, the thrush singing around at me or just hearing the wind is, is absolutely uh, breathtaking. Inside the line, the cat skills. What's going on, everyone? This is Inside the Line, the cat skills. I'm your host, Stash. If you don't already know, um, this this podcast, this episode is going to be a little different than the previous ones. I do not have an interview for tonight. I had some crazy weeks in the past couple of weeks. I went to the Finger Lakes for a vacation. I came home and then I had to go to the ER for a little problem with my stomach. Uh, I had diverticulitis and uh, stuff wasn't, didn't feel right. So uh, I had to cancel my my interview with uh, a person that I look forward to doing an interview with, uh, Sarah Bacon from Scenic Route Guiding. I can't wait to do that interview, but I had to cancel that. And then three days after that, I had to go down to New Jersey for an amazing wedding from my wife's cousin that uh, got married and it was absolutely phenomenal so i had to cancel my interview last week and uh we'll reschedule that again but uh this week i'm gonna do a solo podcast um which is feels pretty pretty weird just doing it by myself and uh it's almost like when i first started doing everything by myself testing everything by myself and it just felt odd so but The cool thing is that this episode is uh, me solo, and it's also going to be about hiking solo. That's the hot topic of the night, hiking solo. So yeah, first off, I would like to thank a sponsor. Recently, like last night, I got an email saying that somebody has supported my podcast on my website, and I was just like, no way, this can't be real. But indeed, it's real. So I would like to thank our first uh, supporter, and it's uh, basically a monthly supporter. So uh, Katrina Weinig, Weinig, Katrina Weinig, thank you very much for supporting Inside the Land of Catskills. Um, please get a hold of me if you're listening to this. I'd like to reach out to you and thank you personally for uh, supporting this podcast. Uh, cheers to you, and thank you very much. I'm not really drinking anything tonight. I'm, I'm having water once again because hopefully my stomach will get back to, to normal if I drink a lot of water. So, yeah. So, cheers to the water. I haven't been on any hikes lately. Let me correct that. We did go on two short hikes in the uh, Finger Lakes with my friend Chad. We were up there for his uh, wedding reception. They had their wedding last year, and of course, through, through COVID, they couldn't have the uh, reception. So they had it this year, and we went up there and took five, six days off and went around the Finger Lakes. We tried to do two hikes, but uh, it started pouring raining at like 4 o'clock in the morning, and by the time we went out at like 9, 10 o'clock, uh, the streams were flooding. So Chad took us to two places that I've been to with him that uh, are absolutely phenomenal, and we can only go not even a quarter in into the hike and uh we were shut down by raging torrents and nothing that we could cross usually you go to these places and you get your feet wet and then you check out the beautiful you know 60 to 90 to 100 foot waterfalls in these areas and these massive gorges this was based outside of naples if you ever get a chance go up there check it out naples uh new york and the finger lakes is absolutely stunning beautiful small town massive gorges massive waterfalls great place to uh take the kids sometimes to a certain point but yeah we got flooded in and but we enjoyed our time with with chad and uh chad once again hopefully if you're listening thank you for an awesome time we had a great time at your wedding we had a great time hanging out with you uh and i say we as in me and my wife 
So yeah, so let's uh, this this session is going to be probably a little bit shorter than normal. Uh, usually it's around a, an hour long, but I have a feeling this is going to be a little bit quicker because uh, it's just going to be me tonight. So let's uh, kick in some Catskill history. All right, tonight's uh, Catskill history. This is about one of the biggest person that is a. Uh, step foot in the Catskills and build an industry in the Catskills, uh, Zadlock Pratt. Some of you might have heard of him uh, because of Pratt's Rock in Prattsville. Uh, Prattsville is basically named after Zadlock Pratt, or he named it himself. I got almost all my information from an amazing book called The Catskills, Its History and How It Changed America by Stephen M. Silverland and Raphael D. Silver. Um, check out that book. Awesome book. I've read the whole thing from front to start to end, and it's a, it's an amazing book that tells history about all of the Catskills, which is which is absolutely phenomenal. So let's begin. Let's Zadlock Pratt, who was born in 1790 in Stephentown, New York, uh, saw his first earnings from pickling and peddling wild huckleberries. At the age of 20, he was apprenticed to a Green County saddle maker, which led to his becoming a journeyman saddle maker under his father's wing for a mere $10 a month. $10 a month, wow. Um, with the money he saved after a year, he went into business in the Catskills with his older brother Ezra and his younger brother Bennett, starting a small tannery that shuttered just in time to avoid ruin caused by the Great Depression following the War of 1812. Um, the tannin industry took raw animal hides uh, which were sourced internationally and produced treated leather. Uh, we'll talk about the whole tanning industry in a little bit and how that works out because uh, it's uh, it's not complicated, but it it can be if you don't know what you're talking about or you don't know what you're listening about. <laughs> Ten years later, with his fourteen thousand dollars from fur trading and the manufacturing of ash ores, uh, which are paddle for a boat um, that he sold to the U.S. Navy, Pratt feeling what he called half-rich with $14,000, drove a one-horse wagon into the Schoharie River Valley in Greene County. There in the tiny village uh, of Schoharieville, uh, later to be called Prattsville, he bought acreage that formerly belonged to the heirs of Joannes Hardenberg's brother-in-law and began work on a new tannery. I didn't look up Johannes Hardenberg if he had to do with anything of the town of Hardenberg right outside of uh, Big Indian. So I'll have to look into that later. So unfazed by Schoharieville's long distance from the Hudson River, which hindered the transportation of the rawhides from the river to the tannery and back again as finished leather, Pratt accurately observed it's easier to carry the hide to the bark than the bark to the hide. On November 17th, 1824 to celebrate the completion of the dam that would supply power to the tannery and show the locals he was no ordinary tanner, Pratt swam the length of the Skahari Kill in the freezing cold. His tannery, which would become the largest in the world at its time, opened 83 days after the spring thaw. Uh, in addition to the Prattsville facility, uh, he built tanneries in Wyndham and Samsonville, New York, and Aldenville and Gouldsboro, Pennsylvania. Pratt kept his men satisfied with the lives of hard work and small pay. Also in Pratt's employment were those seasonal workers considered the hearts of Catskills and tanning industry. They were called the peelers. The peelers would go out first of every May, and these set out into the forest, peeled away the hemlock bark up to the first limbs, leaving the rest of the tree to rot, then stacked up the bark in cord piles to dry before hauling it to the tanneries. There, a water-powered mill resembling a huge coffee grinder transformed the bark into a fine powder that would be taken to a leech house to be mixed with boiling water and left to steep for about a week until it turned the liquor used to tan. Tanning itself back in the days uh, was exhausting. You got to haul 100-pound water-drenched hides on the production line before pounding them into suppleness with huge water-powered hammers studded with multiple iron pins. Next came the removal of the hair from the exterior layer with the harsh lime solution. Only one second layer, known as a true skin, became leather. The treated hides were soaked for an average of nearly six months in vats containing the tannin distilled from the hemlock bark. Finally, after rinsing in clear water, they were ready to be transported from the Catskills to what they call the swamp 
in New York City. That's where the tanning wood trading would take place. It was also named because tanning's abysmal byproducts, its noxious odors and waste, made the area smell like a swamp and even worse. You can probably hear my dogs right now barking at absolutely nothing because it's completely black outside. So those dogs can be a handful. So yeah, uh, the swamp has also be, became, the, by the middle of the 19th century, it become the largest leather market on earth. Uh, so yeah, hauling them to all the way from the Catskills down to lower Manhattan to the swamp has got to be fun <laughs> and exhausting. One time just before the Mexican-American War in 1846 to 1848, the Hudson weather was frozen, so the hides could not be brought down via slop as they normally would. Pratt knew that the city was running low on available weather, and he knew that prices were very high because of the gearing up for war. So he loaded up the sleds, brought down his own hides, and drove them right into lower Manhattan. There were comments in the papers about his arriving with four horses and looking rather stately atop his tanned hides. The words used to describe the horses were proud and iron gray. As a boss, Pratt prided himself in training his employees in the fine craft of tanning, as he was hands-on standing alongside his crew of 60 from the time they awoke at 5 to 5 every morning before a hearty breakfast together. At noon, they shared a full-course meal of good boiled beef, pork, potatoes, turnips, cabbages, wheat bread and butter, and sometimes even roast. And after working through the afternoon, the day shift went home to their families to be bed by 9, according to Carolyn Bennett, the director of the Zadlock Pratt Museum in Prattsville. So check that place out. It's pretty neat. I like it. Um, Pratt purposely situated his mansion only a certain walking distance from the factory so that should a work stoppage by the night crew arise, he could hear the machinery grind to a halt and rush over to handle the problem. So he was very, very into this tanning. In a trafe rife with uh, secrets, Pratt openly shared his details about the tanning process with anyone who would listen. And where most tanners exhausted the hemlocks in their area and then closed up shop, leaving behind shantytown and jobless workers, Pratt arrived in Scaharyville and told few families that then living along the Scary Creek, I come to live with you and not on you. And he kept his word. Pratsko became as known later on as the gem of the Catskills. And it really is a gem of the Catskills. We'll talk a little bit about Prattsville. I drive through there almost every time I go through the Catskills. Um, Pratt built one of the first planned communities in the United States. He wanted a town where workers would come to their wives and children and bankrolled 100 homes for his workers. He endowed three churches, two academies, and an opera house. He funded the town newspaper and the printing plant, which was the first printing press in the Catskill Mountains. Streets were lined with shade trees, miles of bluestone sidewalk lay laid, and Prance financed a woolens factory, a cabinet-making facility to match factories, an oil cloth factory, a machine shop, and foundries. He opened a bank that printed his own currency with Pratt's picture on it, and his banknotes traded at partly with the U.S. dollar and were redeemable at Wall Street banks. Were someone in need of a, of a loan, Pratt studied his face and hands, and if the face appeared honest and his hands showed evidence of hard manual labor, the loan was granted. Once driving near Prattsville, Pratt encountered a sad-looking boy from Oneana, my hometown, who had taken a large flock of sheep to New York on behalf of some chiseler who made a false promise of payment on a ticket home. Now on foot and hungry, the youngster told the story to Pratt, who, according to folklorist Alf Evers, was not the kind of man to let a mere empty pocket stop him from giving a hand to a fellow mortal in trouble. Pratt picked up the flat stone from the side of the road and scratched a check on its surface. Take that down to my bank in Prattsville, he told the boy, and they'll give you cash. What an amazing guy. That's uh, someone you would want definitely running your town. Though it failed his 1848 bid to become New York governor, Pratt, who tired from tanning in 1859, claimed that his leather furnished the soles of 10 million pairs of boots and shoes, and that if the skins he tanned were placed in continuous line, they would stretch 13,000 miles and cover 700 square acres. Toward the end of his life, in an immodest bid for immortality, he hired an itinerant stonecutter to carve a memorial to himself in the Catskill Mountainside, 500 feet above the town that bore his name. The crude rock carvings, which still can be seen and are still there, include Pat's brust, rendering of his tannery, a horse, a hemlock tree, a brawny arm holding a sledgehammer, and the self-invented Pratt family coat of arms. Its description, do well and doubt not. 
So if you're ever around in the uh, Prattsville area, check out Pratt Rock. It's not even a quarter of a mile hike to the amazing stone carvings. Plus, you go up above the stone carvings, you'll get a beautiful view of the Schoharie Valley. And uh, check out the museum there in Prattsville. Um, check out the waterfall in Prattsville. Very beautiful place. Um, Prattsville also uh, is still recovering from the great Hurricane Irene of 2011. It uh, was hit the hardest by the, the hurricane. So go there, check out the place, uh, purchase stuff in the town. Go in town, have something to eat, check out Ace Hardware, check out the grocery store in there, buy whatever you can, uh, support the town. That's what I say. So that's tonight's history about Zadlock Pratt. So check it out. So let's get on to our, uh, our topic of the night, which is hiking solo. Now, a lot, I see a lot of people online and uh, ask me about hiking solo because a lot of people fear for hiking solo for some reason. But someone I understand, uh, my first hike ever uh, in the Catskills, my first 3,500 hike ever was solo. Surprisingly, my wife let me go, <laughs> which was pretty weird. But I did a lot of research. I did a lot of planning for it. I was nervous, but I did it and I survived. And the funny thing is, you know, I wasn't fully prepared like they tell you to do online because, you know what, um, I mean, this was probably six, seven years ago, I started hiking in the Catskills. Um, I've done earlier hikes, uh, but they were nowhere as serious. So I wore, I believe it was khakis and a regular cotton t-shirt, which you shouldn't do. But you know what? I survived. I had fun and I pursued it even further. But, you know, people, you know, ask a lot. I see a lot of questions on Facebook book groups of people asking about hiking solo and they don't want to fear hike or they fear hiking solo and they want buddies to, uh, to hike with. And you know what? I understand. Um, the thought of being alone in the middle of the woods scares people. Uh, it scares people a lot, uh, especially, uh, not to be sexist, but women. I understand. Definitely. Uh, we definitely have thoughts that can sometimes get stuck in your head while you're hiking solo. I mean, it's completely silent, you know, you got the wind and maybe some birds chirping, but that's about it. So stuff gets going in your head. Uh, what if the bear's out there? Uh, what if there's a pack of coyotes out there somewhere? Uh, biggest probably thought of some people when they're hiking solo what if a serial killer is out there <laughs> there are definitely uh a lot of thoughts going through your head and one of the the bigger ones uh what if i get lost while solo so there's a lot of uh thoughts that can that are going through your head when you're hiking solo some people think uh you know different trails might lead to different places or uh you know they they don't see a marker for a certain amount of time they think they're they're lost but uh that's one of the biggest ones, uh, definitely, is uh, getting lost is a, is a definite fear and a thought of when you're hiking solo. I, to be honest, uh, of the hundreds of times I've hiked in the Catskills, mostly in the Catskills, because every other place I go to, I, I go outside of the Catskills, I go with my wife, um, I'd have to say 65% of the time I've been out in the Catskills, I've hiked solo. My days falls off on weird days, my days off fall on weird days, uh, Tuesdays and Sundays. So most people don't have Tuesdays off. So I usually go hike solo. Um, if I do it on a Sunday, it's usually with my wife or a SAR team member or I have a SAR drill. So I'm usually busy on, on Sundays or I'm being occupied with somebody else on the trail on, on Sundays. Uh, but most of the time, uh, spent on the trail is a Tuesday by myself. And you know what? I love it. I think hiking solo is, is great to get connected with yourself. And uh, to me, it really strengthened me to on further hikes, and it gave me a lot of confidence, especially after doing several of them. You know, I, I probably did 13 solos uh, in the beginning of my 3500 pursuit. Uh, my first hike was Balsam Mountain, and that was solo. So, yeah, I find it, hiking solo great, um, and I find it, like I said, a way to connect with yourself. So let's talk about what is needed, what is prepared what you should have when you're hiking solo. Of course, the 10 essentials are needed. Food, water, emergency shelter, extra layers, a multi-tool, navigation, illumination, first aid, fire, and heat and sun protection. Uh, we'll definitely go on to those later on. We'll talk about more and more into that stuff. One of the, probably the most important factor that you must consider when hiking solo is uh, the proper gear. 
Um, one of the biggest necessities while you're on the trail alone. Water, of course, food, and for me, footwear. Proper footwear with good traction and good grip will possibly save your life. You know, you have your crappy footwear, you're going to be slipping all over the place. Uh, and the kayak skills, there's rocks everywhere. Small slip, you can break your knee, you can break your ankle, you can break, you know, anything. Uh, when you're slipping down a massive rock or a big boulder or a steep section. And uh, if you have the proper footwear, you know, some grip, that might not happen. So why not go out there and get, I know it's, it's tough, but, you know, go out there and get an expensive pair of shoes that have great traction on it. And uh, those slips will not happen or they, they might lower your chance of getting injured on the trail. So that's a very big important factor for me when I'm hiking solo is that I chose great traction for hiking and uh, comfortable shoes for hiking. I, I wear shoes and I might switch to boots in the, in the winter, but it's usually shoes. So, But definitely great traction shoes helps hiking solo because it gives you confidence of going up those steep sections that might be slippery. Another one to consider is uh, strong and sturdy backpacks. Um, I've gone through several backpacks. I kind of overdid it when I started. I bought a 65 liter backpack for hiking a day hike, 65 liters. 65 liters will basically carry you through a week's long expedition <laughs> while hiking. So I don't know why I got such a big one, maybe because I you know, overthought it and I wanted to be prepared, but you know, it didn't do bad. It didn't do bad at all. You know, it carried a lot more than I, I needed to. So over the years, I've, you know, taken it down a bit. I went from a 65 down to a 60, and uh, it was a lightweight one. And then uh, I figured out, I found out, you know, it wasn't really supportive on my back, and it just kept pulling me back. You know, it wasn't that great. So I went on to a more expensive backpack uh, instead of going cheap. I went expensive. So I found out that, the, to be honest, the more expensive, the better. I got the recent one I got was a, a while back was a 55 liter Osprey. And I even take this on small day hikes. So uh, most of the time you don't need to go that big, but I do carry extra, me myself, I do carry extra gear while going hiking solo, just in case something happens, number one, number two, in case somebody else needs help on the trail. But yeah, I found out with hiking, going cheap, is not the good idea. Found out with snowshoes that the cheaper the snowshoes, the crappier the snowshoes, more stuff will break. Like I said, shoes. I started off with with you know just regular hiking shoes from. Oh man, I don't even know where I got that from. But I started off with just regular crappy hiking shoes, and they broke within you know three or four hikes. They ripped apart because I was using them too too much. So I went and got me a good expensive pair of shoes uh, that have you know last. I believe this one is last over like 60 hikes, so I can't even imagine how much that 60 times like five miles is, you know, a good amount of over 200 miles. So I I found out with gear, going cheap is not the way to go. You want to go expensive and what's comfortable. Uh, the more expensive means the uh, the more reliable it is. So so yeah, uh, there's a couple thoughts from from hiking solo. So let's talk about the 10 essentials that you definitely need on a hike. Number one important thing is water. Water, stay hydrated. I usually carry with uh, my expeditions, even though, you know, it might be a two, th two, three mile hike, or it might be, you know, a 10, 12 mile hike. I still carry the maximum amount of water I can. I have a three liter bladder, and I usually fill it up to two or more, depending on the heat of the day. And then I have two side pockets full of one of them. I usually carry a Arnold Palmer iced tea uh, for my lunch. And then usually the other one has a, a smart water bottle with, uh, with water in it. So usually sometimes I carry two to five liters of water for just a day hike, which is, which is crazy. But still, water is very important. You stay hydrated. You stay focused which is really good because you want to stay focused on the trail so you can get down to steep areas or you can hop over rocks or stuff, stuff like that. So uh, you don't want to get all delusional and, uh, you know, start getting dizzy and then fall and some, all of a sudden you've broken your knee. So water, definitely one of the most important things, top three. Second item, second uh, on the 10 essentials, food. Food gives you energy. Um, so 
food is a very important thing. I usually have my lunch, which is usually straight up peanut butter sandwich, just peanut butter. If you've talked with anybody that hiked with me or if you anybody that's hiked with me will just tell you that my peanut butter sandwich is, is absolutely insane. It's probably an inch of peanut butter and then the bread. It's absolutely freaking delicious. I love it. Um, peanut butter is very good for energy. Uh, it's protein, so a lot of protein definitely on hikes. I usually have two side pockets on my backpack that have snacks in it. Usually, uh, my friend calls them old man crackers, you know, peanut butter crackers or cheddar cheese crackers in the backpack. And uh, I also have with me usually potato chips or Doritos or something like that to go along with the lunch. And then um, I always carry some sweets with me. I have Sour Patch Kids, which people love. Uh, big bag of M&Ms, like a $9 bag of M&Ms every time. Uh, Skittles, more crackers stuff like that uh energy bars i usually have i carry a lot i've just realized how much i freaking carry wow um i have energy gel packets uh just in case once again sometimes you're, i'm gonna, going on a large long very long bushwhack you want to keep that energy flowing you want to keep that energy high so you can stay focused on the trail so yeah carry you know as much food as you can or prepare for the food for the day you know, if it's going to be hot, you want more food. If it's going to be screaming the cold, you want to have a decent amount of food still to keep your energy flowing, to keep your body keeping you warm. Uh, food is very important. Energy is very important. Uh, so, yeah, next uh, list on the 10 essentials, extra layers. Especially uh, this goes for the, the spring, the fall, the winter. You know, everybody will look at the weather and, uh, you know, they'll type in like Hunter new york or elka park or you know big indian it's definitely going to be different down in the bottom of the valley from on the top so let's say in the winter you know it's 30 degrees at the uh the trailhead uh once you get it going above further it gets colder and colder and colder so you need to have those extra layers to keep you warm you need to keep that body warm and uh to uh keep that energy flowing through your body as well sometimes you know i've gone out on hikes where it's just like oh it's gonna be you know i love hiking in the winter so i usually sometimes it says 15 degrees you know at the big indian or something like that when i'm gonna go hike balsam lake mountain or something like that but then uh i also go online and check mountainforecast.com and it shows you what the potential wind speed will be and what the potential wind chill will be so base of the mountain you know maybe uh what is balsam lakes probably around 2,000 feet uh you know it might be 15 degrees but you know up at the top on top of the tower it might be a good negative 15 degrees so you might start out with just you know a t-shirt and a long sleeve and maybe a regular uh shell jacket so of course once you start going up you'll you'll maybe take the shell jacket off and you'll be fine but once you start getting up further, you get up to the top, it's going to start getting cold when you're standing there doing nothing. So you throw maybe a puffy jacket in there or an extra shirt, extra long shirt to uh, keep yourself warm. And uh, I found several times, you know, you're going up, you're shedding those layers. And then but once you're up at the top, you're starting to get really cold because those layers are now drenched in your sweat. So you can have those extra layers, take those layers off, put on a new layers, stay warm. That's what you want. You want layers to stay warm and to keep that blood flowing through your body. You don't want to get hypothermia. Hypothermia is not fun. So yeah, next uh, on the list is a multi-tool. So of course they got a Swiss army knife, stuff like that um, to help you maybe cut things. Uh, you know, knives are very helpful in opening things or yeah I, I don't really have much information on a, a multi-tool except for you know helping cut things and uh quite possibly saving your life i don't know i'm not i'm not big on the multi-tool thing i do have one i do carry one but i haven't really used it since ever but definitely important to maybe help you later on Next on the list is uh, navigation, you know, whether several, several different types of navigation, uh, GPS system, your phone, 
which is not really 100% reliable, so don't rely on your phone all the time, please. And uh, another big one is a uh, map and compass. Map and compass is definitely needed on every hike, um, especially bushwhacks, of course. You know, there are several trails that intersect, several spur trails, uh, different color trails, you know. Some of the times you do not want to go on the red trail that is uh, going across Devil's Path and all of a sudden you hit a blue trail that goes on a, down to a trailhead. So uh, maps is really, really one of the top five, top three actually, uh, besides food and water. The map is definitely up there for uh, an essential item because once again, if you're new out in the Catskills or anywhere, a map will get you from point A to point B and then back. So definitely get yourself a map. $17. Come on. $17 is nothing. And they, the New York, New Jersey trail conference maps are waterproof. And they're, I believe they said they're shred proof or something. I guess you should probably get that out and check it out. But they're very, very durable. Uh, I have three different editions, I think a 2016, 2018, and a 2020, I believe, with a new updated uh, elevation. So, And then uh, along with the maps should be a compass, because compass, you know, can save your life, uh, especially when you're lost and you've lost the trail. You know, having the, the compass will definitely guide you back to either where you parked or where you last left yourself. Um, definitely go to a, uh, online class of, uh, map and compass or, you know, a local class of map and compass to get the, get to know of a, uh, of using a map and compass. Plus you can go on a, uh, the Catskill 3,500 hikes of, uh, bushwhacking and, uh, their leaders will definitely teach you how to use a map and compass. It's tough to teach over a podcast how to use a map and compass. Um, it's definitely a hands-on experience that you need to learn how to use a map and compass. Um, I use my map and compass once in a while when I'm definitely not confident on the good old phone that I have. And especially uh, when it's colder outside, it's easier to have the map or the compass right around your neck, have it a bearing, and then just open it up and finding that, closing it back up instead of opening your phone, getting the battery drained because it's cold outside, you know, taking your gloves off, all that crap. So definitely get yourself a map and compass total cost of a map and compass probably not even near thirty dollars so easy stuff and then get yourself to a a class or go look online and youtube and start learning how to use it because it's actually a really great essential skill to learn uh especially when you're hiking uh solo uh let's get to the next uh 10 essentials illumination this is very important uh, when hiking solo and when hiking in general, illumination is huge. Most of search and rescues involve a lost hiker at nighttime that has no illumination and they've only relied on their phone and then their phone's battery dies out. Most of the search and rescues have been because of illumination. So usually I go online and I get an expensive headlamp. The lumens you can get the highest amount of lumens uh, that you want, basically. Uh, the higher, the better, of course. Just don't get too high that it's going to blind your friend if you're hiking with your friend. I've had that several times because uh, being on search and rescue, having the, the brightest always helps with other uh, situations, but it also doesn't help when you're shining that bright light into the, the person's eyes across from you. So go online, get yourself a... Uh, they have definitely uh, put out better headlamps than when I got them, you know, six years ago. Uh, and I've upgraded. They have actually rechargeable head ramps. What I do is, I don't know how reliable those are. You need certain, hopefully the batteries are, are a base of lithium. So they last longer in the, uh, in the cold, but I have, I carry two headlamps with me at all times. I always have the batteries outside of them. So they're not running at all, uh, and draining the battery. So, uh, headlamps, you know, I forgot how many lumens mine is. I think, I, I know it sounds weird, but it's 40,000 lumens. I think one of them and the other one's 20. So, uh, that's for search and rescue. I always carry those every single time I have my headlamps with me. You know, you never know when you're going to run into a situation of where you need a headlamp at night or somebody else needs a headlamp. 
you know, it's always, always prepared for two people for some reason. Let's move next on the list, an emergency shelter. You know, this could be anything from a tent to a, uh, an emergency blanket. Emergency blanket is a small, very lightweight item that you can carry with you that you can, uh, that shields you from the elements of rain, snow, sun, stuff like that. Uh, definitely a great thing to carry when you are out on the trail. Uh, very, very simple, very small, not even the size of your, your hand, and it's very lightweight. So uh, I carry it with me all the time. Once again, being a SAR team member, I always carry it just in case, just in case somebody needs help. You know, online, you those uh, emergency shelters usually go from 20 to 40 bucks. Uh, once again, uh, the more expensive, the better. And then usually the more expensive, the more lightweight it is. But still, anything could help you in a, in a tight situation, in a tight bind when you're in the winter, in the spring, or even in the fall to save your life. Um, so check it out, emergency shelters, only like 20 bucks online. Uh, next up is uh, on the 10 essentials is first aid kit. Any there's there's very many uh, different types of first aid kits out there. You could make your own first aid kit. Uh, we had to make ours for search and rescue, and it's pretty heavy. But you know what? That is definitely something I'm worth paying for to have the better kit for the crazier situation per se. So. First aid kits can range from usually $25 to up to $300. Once again, the, probably the, the more expensive, the uh, the larger it's going to be, but uh, the more variety it's going to be, basically. There is definitely several things extra we have to put in there for search and rescue, but most of the stuff uh, in a first aid kit is usually easy stuff like... Um, Bandages, gauze pads, antiseptic wipes, uh, cotton tips, moleskin, burn cream, uh, maybe a finger splint once in a while. Elastic bandage is definitely going to be in there. Sometimes an instant ice pack, um, some EMT shrears, uh, duct tape might be in there. Safety pins will definitely be in there. Um, gloves, uh, some plastic gloves. You know, stuff like that, anti-itch cream, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, rehydration tablets might be in there. It depends, once again, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, if you just want the basic or do you want the uh, the experienced, uh, amazing stuff. Once again, everything on a first aid kit uh, I have to carry because it's just what I have to do. So... I usually I carry that most of the time if I'm going on a any 3500 hike or a uh, a little bit riskier hike I will take the first aid kit uh, even though it's our uh, mine is freaking abnormously heavy but hey that'll happen all right next on the list uh, of the 10 essentials of fire starter fire starting kit so uh usually you'll see these online it could anywhere be you know from a lighter Waterproof matches, strike on box matches. Um, there are other ones called uh, magnesium strikes that could help you start a fire. And then you could also have other stuff in there that you could make yourself. Like um, some, what we, what I use is I've taken, I know it sounds really weird, lint from the, the dryer and dryer sheets from the dryer. I've soaked them in Vaseline and then I put them inside of a a plastic bag and that will uh the vaseline keeps the flame going a little bit longer for you to build your fire a little bit better and to get things going like i said uh sometimes the more expensive is, is the better uh you can have uh, several varieties of uh fire starting kit simple stuff like like i said waterproof uh strike on match or you can go with magnesium shear where you just strike it together it's a strike and then it'll create a spark and then the spark will light something on fire if you have you know leaves or some really good kindle or something like that but once again for for search and rescue i made i have my own little kit set up and uh i have a bunch of strike on box masters that are waterproof and i have the magnesium strike that you use and then i also have the lint in the dryer dryer sheets uh soak them vaseline and that'll get your fire fire going so yeah that's that's one of the 
the second to last one and the last one is heat and sun protection so once again basic stuff heat and sun protection like uh sunblock you know lip gloss uh that has uh got some spf on it once again the the higher spf the better protection somewhat that's what everybody says but i've heard different stories and i forgot what i heard but i heard that anything above like 15 spf is uh, all a bunch of bs and it just wears off a little bit quicker so it doesn't work as better but check that out online i don't know what i'm talking about sometimes and i don't know where i heard it from uh, sometimes i forget what i did yesterday so yeah but that's uh the last of the 10 essentials heat and sun protection so we'll go over them really quick 10 essentials water food extra layers multi-tool navigation illumination emergency shelter first aid kit fire starting kit and heat and sun protection so uh usually when i'm, I'm in an interview i ask people questions and stuff uh and um i don't have anybody to ask questions too so i'm gonna ask myself questions uh what do i think about when i hike alone usually while on the way up in the, the steep spots or even just going up like a simple fire tower road i usually think why the fuck am i doing this most of the time that's why I, what i'm thinking why the hell am i doing this why am i putting myself through this crap and usually it's because of the beautiful stunning view at the top or when i get to the the balsam smell towards the top or just listening to the sound of uh, some of the birds like the the thrush singing around at me or just hearing the wind is is absolutely uh breathtaking but that's what i'm usually thinking while going up and i'm sweating and i'm panting and everything is why the fuck am i doing this definitely but that's what i uh one of the things i think on i think about a lot when i'm hiking alone uh another thing i think about is what's the view going to look like at the top uh, is there going to be clouds? Is it going to be sunny? You know, is it going to be high flown wind? So the clouds will be flowing quick and stuff like that. Will I be able to see certain peaks from, from here? Uh, are they going to be blocked by the clouds? You know, is something going to be in clouds? It's a lot. You know, I think about that while going up. I uh, think about the trail, you know, check it out and look all around and checking uh, the trail markers, seeing if some of them are from old school or there's some of them that are new. Another thing I think about is the sounds of nature. Like, will I be able to hear the, the Bicknell thrush when I get up top? Quite possibly. Will I see some good old vultures flying around me? Maybe. Usually think about music uh, in my head. That's a big one uh, because I'm a musician and I love music. I'm usually singing something in my head or I'm usually wondering uh, what's going to be on the playlist on the way home and stuff like that most of the time i'll just be singing a song in my head or i'll actually sing it out loud usually i listen uh, i sing some steel panther while uh going up the mountain especially on the tuesday when nobody else is with me because those are inappropriate songs that you shouldn't sing on the trail but i still do it another thing i think about is there is there anybody else on the trail uh is there going to be anybody else on the trail and that's the good thing about hiking on tuesdays is there's very rarely anybody else on the trail and i love it I do like socializing. I, I, I got to admit, I do like seeing people on the trail and and uh, saying hi to them and ask them how their hike was and stuff like that. But usually uh, I'm wondering if there's anybody at the top, like if that one car is parked there, is that person going to be in the top, you know, checking out the view like I am. One of the other things I also think about uh, while going solo is uh, the next hike. What is my next hike going to be next week? Or, you know... What are we going to do on, you know, next Sunday? Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? I mean, those are the things that are usually going on through my head. Mostly, it'll, it'll mostly be about music or about the view at the top. Like, I can't wait to see this view. I'm so excited about this view. And then usually on the way down, I'm, I'm usually regretting everything because of my knees, my horrible, horrible knees. Uh, but I'm also thinking about the next hike and how amazing that, that hike was. So... And I can't wait to get on the next hike. So yeah, um, that uh, is my my solo hiking experience. I'd have to say we're gonna wrap it up here. If you have any questions about hiking solo, uh, get get with me. I will give you any information possible. 
Uh, I love hiking solo. I'd love to help out people hiking solo because it is great experience. You know, you don't always have to do like what I do is bushwhacking solo. <laughs> I hear a lot of people saying you should never bushwhack solo. Hmm. I've done it a lot. So you just got to have a lot of confidence and you got to know what you're doing and you got to be safe. That's one of the biggest things while hiking solo is being safe, not just flying around and taking risk, but being safe is, is definitely one of the biggest considerations to think about when hiking solo. So, yeah. So that wraps it up. Uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors. If he ever gets back to me, OER equipment rentals, outdoor equipment rentals, uh, like to thank him for maybe sponsoring us. Uh, if you need personal lope, it'd be again snowshoes, you know, GoPros, snow shovels, anything uh, he might have. Check it out. Check it out online. Look up outdoor equipment rentals in Goshen, New York. Um, I'd like to remind people that you can subscribe on any platform. That would be great. Subscribe. Give me some feedback. And then also, if you go to my official website, which is ITL Cat Skills dot podcast page dot io that's where you can check out our original real site that i have which shows the episodes about me uh, how to contact us how to subscribe and there also is a button at the top called donate to the show and buy us a coffee buy me a coffee you can just put in any amount you want 50 cents 25 cents a dollar whatever um any bit is is great any bit you know will help along with this. I'm not doing this for free, but you know what? I'm having fun doing it. So if you donate, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, if you don't donate, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm having fun doing this, but yeah. And I, once again, I would also like to, uh, give a shout out to, uh, Katrina, uh, Weinig again for being our first supporter of the, of the show. So thank you, Katrina, once again. Um, so yeah, that wraps up the night. I hope you all have a good night, and I hope you enjoyed this this podcast. All right. Peace. Peace.